Hello and welcome back. Today we're encapsulating all of my off-season work and looking at a complete draft strategy. Now you don't have to use this draft strategy, but if you're new to fantasy hockey, this will definitely help you out and it'll get you probably 85% of the way there towards your championship. It all starts with a good draft and you need to set a couple of ground rules right off the bat to guide yourself throughout the process. Now, in my off-season work, we looked at positional scarcity, buy low, overdraft candidates, forwards by position, defense, goaltending, etc. All of that is available in the 2324 draft series playlist on my channel. But before we go any further, why should you listen to me at all? This is my background going back to 2008, about 15 years of data. And as you can see, I was middling at best, never above sixth place until 2018 when I started implementing elements of this strategy. And the first element of that was not drafting a goalie in the first or second round. And then we built from there. As you can see, this worked quite well. Uh, and last year I had a 74.2% win percentage. I had four teams. I won two first places and two second places. So things did work really well for me and a number of my uh, Patreon members and followers of this channel. Uh, if you want to take a look at last year's draft strategy, it's available in this playlist. And these are all the videos and I'll go over really quickly what the fundamentals of the draft strategy are. So rule number one, don't draft a goalie in the first or second round. You can check this video out and a number of others for that. Uh, rule number two, you want to draft two elite power play quarterback defensemen. There's a little tweak to that this year, so stay tuned for that in this video. Rule number three, you want to favor goal scoring wingers over centers who are assist uh, heavy. So uh, we went over this again a number of times in the offseason in the 22 23 season recap, uh, which is available as a playlist on this channel as well, where you can see how these rules stacked up over the course of the year and if they ended up working. Spoiler alert, they did. Uh, rule number four is mainly for a hits and blocks league, which is how to add max value with hits and blocks. But the fundamentals of this strategy are still intact. As I just mentioned, there are some tweaks and adjustments that I've had to make as I've dug into the data over the last year. So what are those adjustments? Step one, know your league scoring system. So is it a category league? Is it a points league? Uh, if it is a points league, how are those points awarded? No matter what I or anyone else tells you in terms of pick up this guy, he's a league winner or whatever, none of that matters if your league scoring system is different from the person who's giving the advice. So just as a quick example, I was in a league that weighs face-offs, shots, and hits as one point each. And after two full seasons in this league, someone commented in the group chat, what does FW mean? And I was a little bit flabbergasted because that was my entire strategy. I made every winger a center who takes face-offs. So every one of my forwards was putting up a minimum of 10 points every single game. So if you don't do this, you're basically playing with one arm tied behind your back, or you're blindfolded throwing darts aimlessly. You have no idea where they're going to land, and you have no strategy or focus for what you're going to do in your draft. So you have to learn your point system, know it, and use it to your advantage. And in order to do that, you go to league at the top here in your Yahoo account. If you're not playing Yahoo, it's a little bit different, but uh, essentially you just go to your league and then settings. You have to scroll down on Yahoo to get these, uh, but this is going to give you a sense of what you want to focus on. So just looking at this at a glance, goals are a little bit more valuable than assists. In terms of goaltending, wins are going to be valuable. Same with shutouts. So those are the things that you're going to want to focus in on. But you can also head right on over to the Data Draft Custom Rankings dashboard and plug those numbers in. And when you do that, you get a customized scatter plot of the most uh, valuable players in your league format. So for this example, these are the point weightings for what you just saw. You can see how elite Connor McDavid is. You can see some of the guys uh, that are further across to the right have a higher rating in your league format. And the guys who are closer to the top have a higher three-year unweighted average for completeness. So how complete they've been over the last three years. So these two dots down here are Tage Thompson and Jack Hughes. This is a screenshot. So in the interactive version, you will see their names pop up when you hover over them. Uh, and then at the top, these guys are more complete, but maybe a little bit less valuable in terms of uh, your custom point uh, weighting. And then over here, you can just see the list. Now with this list, if you're using this during your draft, if you can keep up with it, as guys get picked, you just right click the person's name and click exclude and that will take them out of the list. So it will give you a continuously updating list of guys that are still on the board that you can choose from in order of how they're rated 
uh, based on your point weighting systems. This could be a really big tool. You can find access to this in the Patreon link in the description below. But if you don't have that, or if you're in a categories league, what you wanna do is you wanna corner the market in two or three different categories. So every one of your players that you draft, you should say to yourself, okay, we saw that example with the point weighting. Goals were a little bit more valuable. So you wanna focus in on goals. And that's what I did. This is two years ago. I didn't do this exercise again this season, but this is from two seasons ago. I led the league in terms of goals. Uh, and then I was second in terms of shots because I wanted to factor those two categories in and draft all of my guys with that focus in mind. Now, AC Delaware River ended up winning the championship and I came in third place. I lost to him in the semifinals, but we were two of the best teams in the league this particular year because we did this strategy where we focused on the two most scarce uh, metrics that people are using in terms of our category league. So uh, not a lot of goal scorers out there. And if you have all of them, so for example, there are anywhere between seven and eight left and right wingers per year that hit a 40 goal pace. If you've got three of them on your team, nobody else is going to touch you in terms of those metrics uh, on a week to week basis. So that's how you can kind of play the system a little bit. And when you get all of those guys on your team, they're either going to have to trade with you or they're going to have to do something else to beat you, which gives you a strategic advantage. To recap the work in the off season, goal scoring wingers are really hard to come by, especially right wingers. Point scoring and assist heavy centers are way more abundant than pretty much any other position. But defense who score goals and are around a point per game are the most rare. So those are some of the little tips that you need to have in mind when you're trying to corner the market in two or three categories. You're going to want goal scoring wingers, goal scoring defensemen, and that's why I use these two goals and shots for this example. But you also need to know who you're up against and adapt during the draft because in some leagues the goalie and the defense run happens in the second or third round which is really early and you have to weigh that into your uh, decision making process and adjust for that in other leagues people know not to draft goalies too early and the goalie run happens later so what you can do is go back and check out last year's draft if you were in your particular league last year and see some potential trends so you can go to the draft tab over here on the desktop for Yahoo. You can go to last season down here, or you can go to the league, change the season to the previous season, and then go to draft results to see your draft results from the previous year. And you can get a sense of where guys went last year, who picked what kind of player where. If you really wanna get into the details, this will give you a strategic advantage for sure. And another tip is that some players like to trade just for the sake of trading. We have a guy in our Discord group who I, I guess I'll shout him out, Ty, uh, Tyler, loves to make trades. Uh, he pretty much has already started making trades, even though his draft just happened. Um, and he's very smart about it now, uh, but some of them aren't. And you can send them a ridiculous offer. Now, normally, if you send a two-for-one trade, uh, it's almost always going to be benefiting you if you're the one getting the one player. If you get the best player in the trade, you're more than likely going to win that trade. So if you want, you can find that player who likes to make trades just for the sake of making trades and then try to hit them with a two-for-one trade that benefits you a little bit better. Just another little tip uh, about knowing who you're up against and using that to your advantage. But before we talk about trading any further, let's talk about the draft and specifically risk management. So this is a mock draft I did with our data draft Discord group last week. Uh, and this is just here to show you the two basic tenets. So between the first and the sixth round, you want to take on minimal risk. So shoot for players who have a proven track record of performing up to expectations, whatever those expectations are. So if you say, oh, you know, Jack Hughes, he's going to be a 1.6 point per game player. Well, that's not really a reasonable expectation given what he's already done. Now, he may do that. He's exceptional. But uh, you want to shoot for guys who are living up to their expectations. So a guy who, yeah, he should be a 1.2, 1.3 point per game guy, and he's he's done that in the past. So Matthew Kuchuk, for example, has had back-to-back 100-point -back seasons. So he's a guy who has lived up to expectations. So he's safer to pick in the first round at number five. And he's also dual eligible, which is something we'll get to later. Once you get past that 6-7 range in a 12-team league, so obviously, again, know your league. If you're in a 15-16 or 18-team league, all of these rounds, all of these, uh, you know, all of the phases of the things that I'm talking about are going to change. The numbers aren't really good. So once you hit around this 75 mark, then you want to start adding in some risk. 
There's a number of different ways to do that. You can add high upside players, injury risk guys with elite ceilings, guys like Mark Stone. You can add uh, players who are elite in one or two categories, but not as complete, like a Cole Caulfield. You could add a defenseman who are sharing power play duties, like Victor Hedman. Uh, you could add 1B goaltenders. Uh, Darcy Kemper and Jacob Markstrom are 1As or starters. I don't know how they felt to me there, but uh, this would be a good place to pick up a 1B. You could get some bounce back players. Pretty much every Calgary Flame should be a bounce back player this year with a new coach. Nazem Kadri should be a nice bounce back. Uh, Huberdeau, obviously a bounce back. Lindholm. Uh, this is the range to start trying to think about those guys because they're, you know, the, the risk that you take on in the beginning of the draft. Uh, is going to help you in terms of not taking on risk. And then once you start to factor that in towards the end of the draft, you can hit some home runs. So for example, uh, guys who drafted Eric Carlson last year in the 14th round, they probably won their league or at least made the playoffs because they took on risk where you're supposed to take on risk. They didn't take risk in the fourth or fifth round on Eric Carlson. They took it in the 14th round and it paid off handsomely for them. And just to back that up with a little bit of data that I did in the 22-23 season recap, 50% of all players picked in the first six rounds, regardless of position, regress relative to their ADP at least 15 spots, meaning you could draft them at least a round and a half later than where you drafted them. So, And usually it's more than two rounds later. And injuries do play into uh, some of that, but regardless, 50% of all players picked in this range are going to be relatively disappointing compared to where they're drafted. 70% of all goalies picked in the first six rounds regress relative to their ADP. So you really don't want to pick a goalie too early in this range. Now, I've got Saros at 44. I'm very comfortable with that. And we'll get into goaltending in a little bit. But that just gives you an example that you don't want to swing and miss in the first six, seven rounds of the draft. If you want to take those big swing for the fences kind of swings, you do it later on in the draft where you have a little bit of flexibility. And if somebody you know, underperforms in this range, you can drop them to the waiver wire and pick somebody else up. But you can't really do that in the top of the draft. You're not going to find a 1.2 point per game forward or a point per game defenseman or a guy like Timo Meyer or whoever in the waiver wire. You're going to have to find them in the front end of the draft so you don't want to miss on these top picks. But speaking of goaltending, let's get into the goaltending. So what I'm doing this year is basing my strategy on where I'm picking in the draft. So if you're in the front or the back end of the snake, so picks one through three, nine through 12 in a 12 team league, something like that, consider the tandem. And what you want to do is you want to find a tandem from one of the top defensive teams, Vegas, LA, New Jersey, Dallas, isn't really a tandem, but really good defensive teams that insulate their goaltending really well. Now, right now the, the Vegas tandem is going somewhere in the 130 plus range. So you can find two of the best goaltenders in fantasy, handcuff them together, and feel pretty good about it because they're relatively safe in terms of their fantasy production. You're, you do have to spend two roster spots to you know essentially do one thing, which is stop the puck, but you're getting two guys that are going to do it really well all season long, Logan Thompson, Aiden Hill, for example. Um, the only thing here is if people know that this is your strategy, they might try to snipe them from you, which is why I don't recommend doing this if you're picking at six. So that's why you want to do it if you're you know, 11th or 12th and there's nobody picking in between, or if there's one guy picking in between, you have less of a likelihood that they're going to steal that guy from you and you can get both of the guys in the tandem. The worst thing that could happen, in theory, is you get one of the guys from the tandem and not the other one. And that would be a huge mistake, especially if your guy isn't the guy that's starting most of the time. Now, if you are picking in the middle... Here's where I'm lo- I'm looking to target my goaltenders this year, and this is backed up by a lot of the analysis that I've done uh, looking back to last year's draft and how things panned out. So elite G1s in the 25 to 50 range, that's going to be the beginning of the third round in a 12-team league all the way up to about the fourth or fifth round. That's where the first goalie run usually does happen, and this is where you want to pick up your elite G1. Your G2, you don't necessarily have to get them in this 80 to 100 range, but there's a number of good goaltenders going here. So Darcy Kemper, Jacob Markstrom, Tristan Jari, a number of those type of players who maybe didn't have the best year last year, but they do have a proven track record of being a starter. There's not really a backup pushing them for starts. This is what you want to look for in terms of G2 in this range. And then G3 in the 130 plus range, you can kind of take a swing here pick up a guy with a little bit less name value, 
uh, or somebody that you have a good gut feeling on, whatever you want to you know go for in terms of your G3. But if you do get two heavy starters like Saros and Demko, you don't really need that third goalie because they're going to get you enough volume every single week. And just an ex- as an example, the guy I played in one of my league's uh, championships last year played one goalie the entire time. He played Jake Ottinger, and he got, I believe, six, five or six starts out of him. And I had to do everything I could possibly do just to catch up in terms of wins and whatever else I could chip away because he was so elite because, he, you know, Ottinger's a very good goaltender, one of the top three goalies in fantasy last year. So that could be your strategy if you're in a points league, though. Uh, and let's say your league weights wins and shutouts, as we saw earlier. You're going to want to go for the guys that have the best wins per, uh, win ratio. So wins divided by games played and the best team defense, because that's going to help you get shutouts. Good goaltenders can get shutouts, but goaltenders playing for great teams oftentimes get more shutouts. So for example, uh, two years ago, Jacob Markstrom put up nine shutouts. Now, last year he got one. What changed? It's the same goaltender. Well, Daryl Sutter was the coach for both of those seasons, to be uh, honest with you, but he was uh, you know, giving them a top five defensive team uh, in front of him. So the one year where they actually were playing well for him and they weren't sick and tired of him, he got nine shutouts because they had a really great team defense in front of him. That's what you want to look for in terms of wins and shutouts. But enough goaltending. I've done a whole video on that. Let's move to forwards. Now, the first three forwards off the board should always be McDavid, Dreisaitl, and McKinnon. And you could see that in the scatter plot that I showed you a little bit earlier. Those were the three dots that were kind of out in their own range. Uh, after these players are off the board, what you want to try to do is prioritize dual position players if possible. There's not that many of them, as we saw in the multi-position uh, video I just did uh, a couple days ago. But Matthew Kachuk is there, and he's usually going in that range, ADP 6.2, left wing, right wing. As I mentioned, two back-to-back 100-plus point seasons, uh, and he's a 40-goal pace kind of guy, 45-goal pace kind of guy, 1.38 points per game. So he's going to be a really valuable asset. Uh, you... Could also go for Jack Hughes in this range. He's you know pretty much going at the end of the first, early second round. You also have Tim Stutzla in this late second, early third round. Uh, but these are some dual position guys that you can look at. And if you want more, again, visit that multi-position video. If you can't get one of them, you do want to target goal, shot, and power play wingers in the first round. You know, Rantanen, Pasternak, Kucherov, Robertson, Kaprizov, Ovechkin, all of these guys that you know are going to be on power play one, the fo- the primary focal point of power play one, they're three plus, sometimes four plus shot per game guys. Uh, you know, for example, Pasternak is 4.96 shots per game, second in the NHL. So you're going to want that for sure. If you can't get one of those wingers, get a guy who's similar, but not playing wing. Austin Matthews, he's a four shot per game guy. Um, one of the reasons McKinnon is up here, he's 5.15 shots per game. And obviously, uh, a 50 plus goal scorer uh, in terms of pace. Uh, Matthews has hit 60 before. So these are the guys you want to target in the first round. But what you also want to do is try to augment this by grabbing a deeper value goal scorer and shot volume forward, like some of these guys down at the bottom. So Timo Meyer, dual position eligible, going in the 36 range. You got Braden Point, 50 goals last year. Rope Hints, Bo Horvat's going super late. Same with Mark Shifley. Jared McCann at 87, uh, Sebastian Ajo, he's a steady point per game guy who's also a 40 point, a 40 goal scorer in terms of pace. Uh, Brock Nelson, Pacioretty when he's healthy, he's an elite goal scorer with a ton of shot volume. Cole Caulfield, dual eligible, another elite uh, 40 plus goal scorer in terms of pace. But this goes into the cornering the market on goal scorers, shot volume type of players. If you can get two or three of these wingers it's going to be very difficult for somebody else to keep up with you. But let's move on to defense. Defense is going to be uh, a little bit of what we talked about in the defensive video. This is just a quick summary. But you want one elite uh, and complete power play quarterback defenseman from this list. These are the guys who are pretty much undisputed number one power play quarterbacks. You could maybe throw Mackenzie Wieger in there. Uh, maybe it, you know, a handful of other guys could make a case for being the number one guy. Um, But these are the guys that are going to be safe quarterbacking that number one power play. There's not a ton of, uh, you know, pressure from somebody else pushing them out of that spot. Then you're going to want 2D from the D2, D3 list, 
which was in that defensive video that I did a couple weeks ago. Guys who have elite peripherals and they have a chance to fill in on power play one or run power play two if there's an injury or if power play one slumps. The perfect example would be Hedman and Sergachev. You know, people are fading Hedman right now because they think Sergachev took the power play over, but Hedman quarterbacked that power play for 10 years. You know, if it if it's a bad 15 game stretch and they go back to Hedman and you got him in the 90th, you know, or 90th overall, you know, eighth, ninth round, wherever that is, then you're going to be, you know, laughing all the way home to your championship. So these guys are going anywhere between 40 and 140. You could even go a little bit further back than that. But you do want two of these guys and you want them to have good peripherals, good hits, blocks, plus minus, whatever else your league uses. Then you want one high risk D and or one hits and blocks D. So if you're in a league that has hits and blocks, a categories league or whatever, there's where you pick up your Shen or your Gudis or whoever else you're going to get specifically for that. Or you could get a high risk guy, a younger guy like a Luke Hughes or somebody to that effect that you're high on, but you don't really know if they're going to be the guy. But this will give you a nice balance of an elite power play quarterback, maybe another elite power play quarterback if you can get it, and then a couple of guys that give you peripherals even if they're not quarterbacking the power play. But this brings us to a, kind of a, a pause in the draft. Where should you be by the seventh round? Well, by this point, you should have your first round pick best available. Don't necessarily have to focus too much on position. If you can get a multi-position player, that helps. Then you want one or two elite power play quarterback defensemen, one or two elite goal scoring wingers, and one goalie unless you're using that tandem. If you're utilizing the tandem, you can push that goaltending all the way back past the 100 mark. And this will give you a more potent offense, which is definitely going to help you uh, throughout the season. But you do want to diversify your positions and try to have one of each position by this point in the draft. And also don't tr stack too many players from one team because they're all going to be playing the same schedule. So if you have a you know five players from the Rangers and the Rangers are playing two games in the week that you're in your fantasy playoffs, you're screwed. And you have to find five waiver guys to fill in and you don't have five waiver ads. So think about that a little bit in your draft. And one thing that I've liked to say on this channel in the past is your team is like a race car. If you have five turbos, it won't go any faster. You need each part working in unison to get you over the finish line. And obviously that's not Confucius and a nice picture of an engine there. But uh, why I'm putting this here, even though you do want those right wingers who are scarce, you don't want to draft three of them in the first six rounds. Same with D or any other position. You want to think of your team as this race engine where every part plays its role and it all has to work in unison. Now, if you want to go the extra mile, you can look at the playoff schedule a little bit early to kind of figure out where you're going to target your elite guys. This doesn't necessarily go for all of your guys, but if you're picking between two guys at the top in the first round, this could potentially help you out just a little bit. So teams with the best schedule in the playoffs, uh, Edmonton f uh, factors in three times in this list. So uh, week 23, they have uh, four games. The week 25, they have four games. Week 26, they have six games. So obviously, if you have McDavid and Dreisaitl, you're going to dominate. Um, the Rangers, the Devils, Islanders, Senators, Kraken, Lightning, Leafs, Caps, and Golden Knights all have at least two weeks where they're playing more games than everybody else. Uh, this uh, week 22, the Rangers have five games, but they also factor in on this list in terms of the worst schedule. So uh, they also have two weeks where they're not playing all that many games, including only four games in the final week of the season in the championship uh, if you're you know still using week 26. And then this week 23, after that five-game week, they're getting a little bit of a break as well. The worst schedule goes to Nashville. They factor in three times. So week 22, week 23, and then week 26, they're playing lighter uh, amount of games than everybody else. So this is just going to be a little thing that might tip the scales between two players if you're looking at them uh, towards the front end of your draft. But you don't necessarily have to do this. If you did anything else that I've suggested over the course of this video, you're probably going to be in better shape than you would have been had you not done that. You don't have to follow this. This is just a suggestion. If you're new to fantasy and you want some tips and some advice, hopefully I've given you enough to chew on and think about before your draft. Hopefully you watched this right before your draft and it helped you out a little bit. If it did, let me know in the comments section below. That's going to do it for this video. If you made it to the end, thanks for for watching all the way through and as always I'll see you in the next one.